Devin probably better than I do that I was getting a little sloppy about introductions, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Devin Gaston runs Kane on Campus, um, at, among many other wonderful things, has helped us out so much over the years, um, and designed this class with input. I hope all of y'all completed the survey. If not, um, we'll send another one sometime. Um, designed this class, seven session class, based on the needs specifically of shelter pets and then specifically the needs of our shelter pets and what our volunteers and our staff wanted, what tools they wanted to help them work better with our, um, with our animals here. We are very excited to keep growing our behavior program, which Ashley Litton is in charge of, um, and, and do more for the animals here so that they can have the appropriate mental, emotional, and physical exercise to help them get adopted and to be less stressed here. Um, all of our population, probably not to co cover rabbits and things, because they go out kind of There's quickly. There's no stopping us. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a train of rabbit. We got no problem. Um, next, <laughs> next, that is so exciting. Um, that's why we love working with her, the attitude. and um, we're, we're really excited. So if you complete the whole course, you'll be, you get lots of benefits from that, and you'll be certified. We are doing sort of option if you want to do just dogs and not come to the cat ones, that's fine. Um, and I'll get you some more chairs. Um, but I think there'll be a lot to learn regardless. I mean, you learn about every animal yeah. in, in any which way. Yeah. So the full schedule is, is up and has been emailed to you guys. Um, and I'll let Devin go from here. And I would feel very, very lucky to be able to do this. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I know you have a lot on your plates just taking care of all the animals that are here. Um, and thank whoever completed the survey, and if that was all you guys, thank you so much, because I completely based what we were going to work on on that survey, and what you all said would make your jobs easier and safer, because um, that's what this is really all about. I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with clicker training or using a marker? Any dolphin trainers here? Yeah? No dolphin trainers here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> You talk dolphin. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay, so uh, there's a lot of different training philosophy. There's a, there's a lot of different training schools. But the bottom line is, is any person that tries to modify another sentient being's behavior. Do invertebrates count as sentient beings? Mm -hmm. I think they do. Karen Pryor clicker trained a hermit crab, so <laughs> I didn't want to leave that to hermit crab because the hermit crab rang a bell and it was awesome. Um, so uh, um, if you attempt to modify another sentient being's behavior, you are using operant conditioning on some level. So B.F. Skinner identified operant conditioning. It's, it's principles of learning is what operant conditioning is. We fall under them, as do other sentient beings. And so there are four quadrants of operant conditioning, and which kind of trainer you are is determined by which of those quadrants you are willing to use. And so the four quadrants are positive reinforcement. And by the way, the term positive is mathematical. So it doesn't mean good, it means you're adding something. So there's positive reinforcement which means you're adding something to increase the frequency of the behavior in the future. Positive punishment is you're adding something to decrease the occurrence of behavior in the future. So it's a shock collar, that's a spray bottle, that's a shake can, that's a loud no. Negative reinforcement, you're taking something away to increase the future occurrence of behavior. Um, in traditional dog training, they have a dumbbell exercise where dogs have to pick up a metal dumbbell, which most dogs don't appreciate because metal tastes gross. And one of the most traditional ways they used to train it was they squeezed the dog's ear, they pinched the dog's ear, and when the dog was willing to hold on to the dumbbell, they let go. And that's negative reinforcement. That is the correct face to have. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and what did I leave out? Negative punishment. Negative punishment. Negative punishment is when you take something away to decrease the likelihood of future behavior. That can be something as simple as a back turn. So if your dog jumps up and you turn your back, you are taking your tension away with the goal of decreasing the frequency of future behavior. That is negative punishment. So there are these four principles. 
And as I said, which kind of trainer you are is really determined by which of those quadrants you're comfortable using. So I am, um, so anyone could technically call themselves a science-based trainer because they're using scientifically validated principles of B.F. Skinner to train. Um, I am a compassion-based trainer. So I don't use pain. I don't use the threat of pain. I don't use force because I find that that's, that's a quick way to shut an animal down. And I want an animal that's trying stuff. Because animals that try stuff are animals that are successful with us, right? So that's what we're all about. Now what's interesting about clicker training is it's a technology. And all that basically means is it's rec replicable, right? A lot of people can do it. You can do it with a lot of different animals. Again, um, dogs, cats, bunnies. Did not know you could do it with a hermit crab until Husbands. Karen Pryor did it. And <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the thing. She, uh, she didn't use a clicker, because I'm not sure hermit crabs have ears. I'm not sure how that works. I'm really ignorant about hermit crabs, actually. What she used as a marker instead were the tips of the forceps shaking in the water. So when the crab did what she was waiting for, which was actually swinging up and hitting a string, she shook the forceps and then dropped a little piece of shrimp. And so the shaking of the forceps became the marker. So there's nothing special about the sound of the clicker. What we're using is an event marker. So I really quickly just kind of want to go over what an event marker is about. Because dolphin trainers use whistles. It's easier. Your hands are free. You can choose to use a whistle. Right? You can use a word. You don't have to use a clicker. So question for you. Anyone have any idea how quickly you have to present a potential reinforcer, like a treat, or a ball being thrown, or a leash saying we're going to go for a walk. How quickly you have to deliver it for the sentient being you're delivering it to, to associate it with the behavior. So what I mean by that is, let's say you want to give a dog a treat for sitting. The dog's butt hits the ground. How long do you have to treat the dog? Actually, it's got, the treat's got to hit their mouth. For the dog to know it's for sitting. Three seconds. Three seconds, anyone else want to guess? Two seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Three seconds, two seconds. Anyone else? Two seconds. How many? Two <laughs> Okay, so are we've, we've three and below. Right, three and below. Are you, 33 you? nanoseconds. Okay. <laughs> I, I like that you went to nanoseconds. Too. I like that. Um, you have three seconds at the most. And actually, by the third second, your feedback is 81% weaker. You've got to be fast. This is a problem, right? Because we're not fast. Right? It's like, I'm trying to open the bag, right? You're trying to get stuff. So you got to be really, really, really fast. And this became really obvious, this time situation, um, when they were training dolphins. Because the dolphins were leaping in the air and landing, and then swimming over to get their reward. And in really short order, the dolphins got confused. Well, they didn't get confused. <laughs> they thought they were being trained something other than what they were being trained. So the handlers said, oh, I'm giving you this fish for leaping through the air. But the dolphin said, well, the last thing I was doing before you gave me the fish was swimming up to you. So they stopped leaping. Because they were like, well, where's the trainer? I think I get a fish for just coming up to you, right? And so the trainers were like, huh, oh, this is a problem. <laughs> this is a problem. And it was just confusion and timing. That's all it was. But you got to kind of... shotting the fish didn't work. <laughs> that's the problem, right? We have a logistics issue. How are you going to deliver this fish midair? That's going to be, and slingshot is on the table, right? But you got, you got to be pretty good at it. And something tells me if you beamed the dolphin wrong, it could be a punisher, right? So the dolphin would be like, I'm never jumping again. There's flying fish, right, that hit me, right? So that's got a potential for big time disaster. So um, they decided to go back to Pavlov, who's way cool. And Pavlov taught us, you know what? We can pair a sound with something really good so many times that the sound causes anticipation so intense for what's coming that in a dog it's drool. 
Um, I don't know if dolphins drool. Honestly, I don't. Um, and I don't believe Pavlov had any in his lab. It was pretty cold in Russia back then. I don't, I don't think so. Um, so <clears throat> what they did is they paired whistle with fish. And they paired it so much that when they blew the whistle, the dolphin would pop the head up and go, Where, where's the fish? So it was clear the dolphin understood. When I hear this sound, something really good's going to come. And then they just waited, because dolphins are known to leap. Right? <laughs> and when the dolphin left, they blew the whistle midair. So when the dolphin was actually flying in the air, it got the information. What you're doing right now is going to earn you your fish. Oh, so then when I land and swim over, I'm getting a fish that I actually got for something that happened you know, 30, 45 seconds ago. So the use of a marker added huge efficiency to training because it added clarity to training. Clarity for the animal being trained, right? Now here's what's really cool about using a marker. Again, there's nothing special about a clicker. You can use a whistle. I have some clients that click with their tongues. You can use a word. The only problem with words, especially when you're dealing with domestic animals, maybe not so much with dolphins, <laughs> is they hear human voices all the time. So a word isn't as salient to them. It doesn't stand out in the same way that a burst of a little whistle does or a click does. But you can still use a word. So <clears throat> what is so beautiful about a marker is you don't have to have any personal relationship with the animal you're training to convey really important information. And in fact, your role as conveyor of this really important information is what builds the relationship. That's the foundation it stands on because all of a sudden, you become a resource. You're like a new water hole or berry patch, right? So if you're, water, if you're like a bear and you're out looking for stuff, and you notice a new berry patch, you're going to take intense interest in it, right? Because this is going to feed you. So when you are clicker training, all of a sudden you become a resource. And the dog takes tremendous interest in you, right? And you are conveying information with a click that enables that dog to view the world in a different way because now they're an active agent in that world. And it's their decisions not you, their decisions that caused the click, right? When I make good decisions, the click happens. So any questions about using a marker? How transferable is, you say it doesn't matter what kind of marker you use, mm -hmm. or maybe how important is the consistency? Like here, do we all need to use the clicker? Or one of us uses a clicker, one of us uses uh, a different marker? So that's an excellent question, um, and will lead us to our first demonstration. Laura, go get your dog. <laughs> um, what is critical is that you take the time to let whatever you're training, be it cat or dog, know this sound means food. So let's say you don't want to use a clicker. You're like, you know, my hands are full. This is a mechanical device. I don't have one on me. I can't find one, right? There's always so let's say you don't want to use that's okay. That just means that when you meet up with a dog, your first interaction needs to be, hey, when you hear this sound, I'm gonna give you food. When you hear this sound, I'm gonna give you food. So if it's not a click, it might be, it might be, right? It, whatever you want it to be. But again, here's the beauty of a mechanical marker. I'm really tired. I'm really mad. <laughs> I'm extremely happy. Right? I click the same. Right? Like, so you can't like <laughs> it's, it's like it's like the great equalizer. When you're using human generated sounds, they change. And it's okay, but you want to try to pick something that's consistent. And and I want to say this about using a word. You want to pick a word the dog doesn't hear all the time, right? So yes can be a good word, because it's intuitive, right? Like the dog makes a good decision, yes. And the sibilant sort of stands out. 
but you might be a yeser, right? Like you might have yes in all your sentences and you might be sprinkling it in to and fro. And so then sometimes yes means a treat, but sometimes it doesn't and I don't know what that's gonna be about, right? So <clears throat> the key here is a dog can have 50 markers. Each one of you could have your own individual sound. As long as you take the time to say this sound means treat. And you only have to do it once or twice. So, hi Joe Dog Fog. So I'm gonna let this like, oh, thanks for paying attention to me. What do you think about that? That pace, mm -hmm. that does. That pace. So at this point, thanks, thanks. I'm just gonna start clicking and delivering a little treat. Now when I click, I'm trying not to move. I want the dog to process the click in a vacuum. If I'm reaching for food, the dog just follows my hand, right? Because they're body language readers. So the dog's much more interested in visual movement than in sound. So I'm clicking, and the dog doesn't have to do anything. So this is a really important thing. When you're teaching something that this sound means treat, it's just sound, treat. This dog could be pooping in the corner. Sound, treat. <laughs> doesn't care the dog gets distracted. Sound, Treat. Had to do a few. Hey, Sandy. You want to maybe do yes? I have a question. Yes. I discourage that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> hey. What's the difference between the sound and the treat? Okay, so the question is, how much time do I have if I click to deliver a treat? We're still back to three yes. seconds. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. Um, that is the beauty of the clicker. It yes. buys you time. And how much time it buys you depends on the dog's experience with the clicker. So when I'm starting with a new dog, like right now when I'm teaching the dog this click means sound, I try to get it in three seconds because not much is going on. It's just a click, trick, click, click, click. But when I'm using it to, oh, that was a good decision <coughs> click, you know, you have five to ten seconds. And with my, my dogs are so clicker savvy now, I could probably click and a minute later deliver something. But the key here, by the way, with using a marker is you just use it to teach new behaviors right so it's not like you have to click for the rest of the dog's life right once a dog understands what they're getting clicked for so let's say i start clicking this dog for sitting whenever it sits i don't ask for it i don't do anything to get it, it just makes a good decision i click and treat i start clicking and treating for sits and the dog says huh i think i'm getting Thank you. Clicked for sitting. It starts coming over to me and sitting, right? And saying, hey, you gonna pay me for this? Is this why I'm getting treated? <laughs> well, at that point, the dog fully understands what we're working on. Right now, I'm just clicking for orienting towards me. You pay attention to me, mm -hmm. I click, right? I do nothing for it. I'm not calling the dog. The dog has other options, could do anything else in this room. Dog's mom is in this room. Dog does not have to make eye contact, just has to turn head my way. And keep in mind that with many shelter dogs, their relationship with human beings is complicated. Don't expect eye contact. Prolonged eye contact is pretty rude in the dog world. It's a precursor to a fight often. And so when I first start walking, working with dogs on this, it's like, hey, if you just choose to orient towards me, I'll pay you. So that dog orienting towards everyone else in this room didn't pay, but orienting towards me did, right? So my hope is that I'm going to start seeing more orientation towards me. Now I could be handing the dog the treat. One of the reasons why I'm throwing it is because when I throw it, the dog has to look away from me to get the treat, which gives the dog another opportunity to turn and look at me, right? So I'm throwing the treat so that the dog gets more repetitions in, but I don't have to, right? That's just a, that's a training decision that I happen to make in this moment. <laughs> that's really good. Okay, so had, will you step on the leash for a second? 